The following announcement has been paid for by the Wrestling Epicenter. Hey, everybody. Hey, guys. Hello, ladies. Remember me? <laughs> Let me talk to you, dummies. It's now time. It's beer time. Tick-tock. It's showtime. For the longest-running wrestling talk show in history. We are huge. It's gonna be cool. You're where it's at. You're smart like me. Tune in each and every week. It's better keep listening. Or I'll come out of your computer and, and turn it on for you. Or else I'm gonna kick your sick of tape then. We've been known by a few names. The needs of the many far outweigh the needs of the few. The interactive interview. Interactive interview. Oh, yeah. Interactive interview. The interactive interview. Interactive interview. The interactive interview. Interactive Wrestling Radio. 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 The Blaze. Blaze. 12.60 a.m. The Blaze. The Blaze. Blaze. The Blaze Rock. And a lot of other names. Weekend Warrior of Wrestling. The Pile Driver. The Epa Wrestling Center. Street Count Wrestling. <laughs> the Hours Lab. But it's all one show. The Wrestling Epicenter. Wrestling Epicenter. The Wrestling Epicenter. The Epicenter. Wrestling Epicenter, dude. The Wrestling Epicenter. Don't get off. And your host from day one. By ignorance or arrogance. James Walsh. Wake up, sleepyheads. I can care less. It all starts. What a rush. Thank you very much. I got two words for you. Dumb down. Breaking necks and cash and checks. Now, I've heard a lot about you guys. Check it out. Get out of my face. <laughs> you win. But I'm desperately out of time. So what you gonna do when Blaze Mania runs wild on you? Now. Welcome back to Interactive Wrestling Radio. On the Newsmaker line with us right now is a former WWE superstar. He is Duke the Dumpster Drozzy. Are you on the phone with me, sir? Yes, sir, and thank you very much for having me on the show. It's a pleasure to have you on, man. I can't believe that I haven't had you on before. I've been doing this a long time, and it's just our paths have never crossed. So it's a pleasure to finally sit down on the phone with you here. Yeah, absolutely. It's you know, It's pretty much been just the past two or three years I kind of came out of my hole in the ground I disappeared for quite a while I wasn't really doing anything Mm -hmm. so hey it's my pleasure man I really appreciate it and of course I found you because uh, one of our mutual friends Del Wilkes the Patriot does a podcast and he was promoting your podcast you guys are on the same podcast network so did you want to talk a little bit about the podcast you do and what can we expect when we tune into your show yeah, my my podcast is called Road to Recovery. Uh, <clears throat> a large part of my life these days is working with people recovering from substance abuse issues, which I had uh, my issues with in the past, which is part of the reason I dis- disappeared for so long. But um, it's called Road to Recovery, but we don't just talk about substance abuse. We talk about just generally people that come back from difficult situations and and find a way out and find redemption in their lives and uh, find their way back to recovery. And um, we have some really cool, interesting guests. And we also just have a really fun time. We play some funny games on there and uh, we just have really good conversations. And uh, as you said, I'm, I'm part of the same podcast network. It's WWAB, which is wrestling with anything but uh, started by Avi Klein. He's the mastermind. And he's got about seven of us wrestlers with different podcasts under his uh, under his network now. And I'm just really thrilled and feel privileged to be a part of that family. So, yeah, things are going great. And, uh, yeah, Del Wilkes is such a great guy. And uh, I'm, I'm proud to be a part of that, uh, the same team as him and the other guys. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's a great show. I did check it out last time he promoted it, and I thought, I, I need to talk to this guy. So I'm glad. <laughs> like I said, I'm glad we finally got the chance. Do you absolutely. mind if I ask you a couple of wrestling questions? Go for it. Yes, sir. All right. So I guess my first question is going to be, I don't, I'm don't, i not going to strictly follow a chronological format, but I am kind of anal retentive in that way. Uh, okay. But 
your first appearance with WWE, you were the Duke the Dumpster Jersey. You were one of the first characters to come along that had a day job that went along with being a wrestler. Uh, following you was a dentist and a plumber and, and other things like that. Uh, yours was not as forced, though. Yours felt a little more authentic, a little more eh, real, I guess you would be the word. Uh, why do you suppose that is? And, and did you enjoy the fact that so many of the other ones decided that they were going to have day jobs after you? Well, the reason I would I think is because I was doing the gimmick before I went there. I was wrestling down in Florida as the garbage man, Rocco Gibraltar. I came up with the gimmick, and and um, I had worked on it for quite a while. Uh, and I, the reason I did that is because I knew that was the kind of thing that Vince McMahon would probably grab a hold of. And um, you know, I mean, I remember like the big boss man having the, the you know the the policeman or the prison guard kind of deal and other people like that and it just kind of felt like it went with the way things were in the world wrestling federation in the late 80s early 90s especially and uh and it worked it got me in and uh you know i was i just continued doing exactly what i was doing in florida except they just changed the name to duke the dumpster and, and maybe that had something to do with it and you know if they started kind of going the creative staff maybe went a little bit more in that direction after I came in. Uh, you know, I don't take any credit for that, but if I was a part of that, great. Uh, you know, it was just an interesting time. It was certainly different. And uh, people seem now to be looking back in a, st- a nostalgic way at those years. And I'm really kind of proud of that. And uh, I'm meeting a whole new set of fans because of the that era I came from. So it, it was a blast. Absolutely. And it was a lot of fun for me. I was a 12, 13 year old kid when you first debuted. So (laughs) I loved watching that stuff. It was a lot of fun to watch. Um, I do remember one thing and I remember talking to my friend on the phone. He used to call me every commercial break of Raw or Nitro and years went on later. And he called me up after the apology when you got hit in the head with a trash can and then Jerry Lawler had to apologize for it. And I remember thinking that was really weird. Is there a story behind that? Why did they feel the need to do that? Yeah, when we were setting it, it was on the King's Court episode was on Live Raw. It was live, 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 live as you get. And uh, me and Jerry were talking right beforehand on what we were going to do, and it was pretty simple. He wasn't going to let me in the ring. He was going to make fun of me and tell a bunch of stupid jokes, and I was going to get sick of it and turn around and walk away. And the heat was I had dumped garbage on him my debut match on Superstars because he was, like, goofing on me. So he was mad I dumped garbage on him, right? So the plan was he was going to run up behind me when I turned to walk away. He was going to run up behind and attack attack me. That's all they wanted. And Jerry Lawler said, "Um, would you care if we did something where I attacked you but then grabbed your garbage can and hit you with it? Now, I had been, in, I mean, down in Florida, man, I was hitting everybody left and right. I even got hit with it some. I mean, I, it was just free for all. You could hit anything, anybody you wanted. And I said, yeah, of course. Um, and we ended up asking Jack Lanza, who was the uh, agent, I think, in charge of that segment. And it was just like the perfect storm of everything coming together because Jack Lanza wasn't going to go ask Vince. Jack Lanza just said, just go ahead and do it. <laughs> <laughs> so we went out and we did it that way. And Jerry attacked me. And if you watch the tape of it, it's probably still on YouTube. Um, as soon as he hits me once, I go down and he hits me again. And right as the contact, I believe, is made on the second shot, the camera cuts away way, way, way far away, <laughs> like to the yeah, other side. Yeah, it does of the arena and all you can see is the garbage can lifting up and coming down, lifting up, but you can't see him hitting me anymore because they deemed it too violent for the product at the time. It was, you know, it was family considered family entertainment geared towards the kids still like the eighties. And they decided, they said that was too violent. Uh, So they freaked out. And when we got in the back, they were freaking out. And, like, Shane McMahon ran up to me and he said, what happened? I said, well, we talked about it, and we just kind of decided that would be good. I didn't know there was a problem. So, anyway, immediately after, they had Gorilla Monsoon and Macho Man, who were doing the commentary for live at that time, come on and apologize for it. 
right, on live TV and say, you never see anything like that again. We apologize. And then they turned it into another thing. And I think it had to do with TV stations and sponsors. They were all worried about that. And uh, they made Jerry Lawler do this ridiculous apology thing, which when I saw it, I, you know, I didn't know a lot. But I knew enough to know that kind of was killing off some of the heat. Yeah, it make, exactly. It was making I was it ridiculous. So they made him do that. They taped it. And if you listen to that apology, the uh, studio voice that's telling him to continue and to apologize is Shane McMahon. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, There's a little like, uh, Easter egg for you. Yeah, he was, he was wow. the one because he was working in the studio at the time. In fact, Shane, when I first came in, Shane did all my vignettes with me. We drove around. Stanford and in Greenwich, Connecticut at the dumps and stuff like that. But so he was working in the studio, but yeah, that was him. But that's the story behind that because it was too violent and it really just threw a bucket of ice water on a really great angle. And uh, we never even got a pay-per-view out of it. I got like another Monday Night Raw where Doink and Dink were out there and all that nonsense. And uh, that was pretty much it. Very cool. Very cool. I did watch a few interviews leading up to this interview just to make sure I was prepared. And uh, one of the things I heard in one of the interviews with Hannibal TV, I'll give them a plug, was your relationship with The Undertaker and that you were a part of his crew. Um, kind of going along from what we just talked about with the censor, I don't want to say censorship, but being afraid of the hardcore style compared to what Undertaker just recently said that kind of made the internet go nuts where he basically called the current product soft. And uh, I think a lot of the guys took it to mean that they were soft. What do you think of uh, Undertaker's recent comments calling modern wrestling soft? And do you watch much modern wrestling at all? I really don't watch much modern wrestling. Uh, I, if somebody tells me something cool happened with a rest, certain wrestler or something like that, I'll try to catch it. You know, you'll usually see it. If it was really cool, you'll see it on YouTube. And I'll just catch stuff like that. I don't have TV, really. I don't have the network or anything like that. Um, and uh, so I don't watch the current product, but I would tend to agree with what the taker said. I mean, it was just a different time, man. We had a much rougher road schedule, and, you know, it, it was just a lot different company. It was still what you would consider a mom-and-pop operation, mom-and-pop McMahon, of course, and uh, there weren't <laughs> shareholders, and there weren't, you know, all of that stuff. And there wasn't a bunch of writers. There wasn't a team of doctors in the back to help you if you, you know, stubbed your toe. You know, we had to get along on our own. And, and you had to be a certain kind of tough to make it on that kind of a schedule. It was rough. And, uh, and, and it was just a different breed of people, different breed of guys. You know, uh, I think coming along after that, when Vince opened up the entertainment uh, arm of the company uh, and made it World Wrestling Entertainment and started doing movies and stuff, you had it an influx of people who were not necessarily professional wrestling minded, who were just trying to use it as a stepping stone to get into movies or other aspects of entertainment. And um, it was just a different br bunch of guys or different bunch of people. Now that's not to say these people aren't tough and, and they don't, you know, they beat, they still beat their bodies to death, I'm sure too. Certainly not as much. It's more TV, of a TV product now than a road show. You know, it was kind of the flip. It was the opposite back then. We were doing tons of live show dates, you know, and uh, it was just different. But I would tend to agree with uh, what Taker says about that. I think, you know, a, the talent maybe has softened a bit. <laughs> and that's not to say they're they're weak or they were wimps, but um, it took a special kind of tough to handle that kind of road schedule back then. So, yeah. I, I would agree. I would agree. Another thing kind of coming off of the Hannibal uh, interview that you did was you seem to be kind of friendly with everybody when – the folklore, if you will, is that you had to choose a side. You were with the Click, or you were with the Brett guys, and and things like that. You seem to kind of be okay with everybody. Is that kind of the way I should have anticipated or, or perceived what you were saying there? That you were kind of friendly with everybody around? Yeah, I mean, and I tried to be. I tried to be. You know, you could see certain things go down that you would maybe didn't like too much, like you know, the Click 
certain people in there, like Sean especially, it just seemed like he had so much power, too much power, um, you know, for a lot of people's liking. But uh, that's just the way things were. And uh, for me, man, I was just having a good time, which, again, and I've said this many times, in a lot of ways I was clueless as to the, the business side of things. I was just there having a blast. I mean, in a lot of ways, I was still a wrestling fan uh, <laughs> back there, yeah. just working full time with these guys and having a blast. I mean, I was happy to be there. I wasn't making much money, and but um, yeah, I tried to get along with everybody, and uh, and I was and I was not a necessarily an official member of BSK. Let me just clarify that. There was a time though when everybody who wasn't in the clique was kind of like an honorary member of BSK, and. Uh, you know, we had Owen made hats for everybody and stuff and that said BSK on them and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, we all just kind of hung in the same place on the bus playing dominoes on the, on the European tour. So what the thing about it is the click guys would hang back there too. The click guys were back there playing dominoes with us. It was, you know, the folklore isn't exactly a hundred percent true. I mean, you got along, you had to get along with everybody. Otherwise you were just going to be really miserable. And there was a lot of miserable, really negative, bitter guys around then, too, the guys that weren't getting a push. Um, later on, I would become one of those. But uh, I tried not to be, and I tried to get along with everybody. Very cool, very cool. Um, so right after you left, it almost seemed like very soon after you left, that's when Nitro caught on fire and WWE changed their programming to where – Certainly, they weren't going to censor somebody getting hit with a garbage can anymore. I mean, they did <laughs> they did a dumpster match at, at WrestleMania a couple of years yeah. after that, in fact. Um, um, wrestling just completely blew up. It was bigger than I had ever seen it, maybe even bigger than in the 80s when, you know, I was first a fan. Um, I guess my simple question would be, did you kind of wish you were a part of that era, the Attitude Era, the Nitro Era, um, instead of the... I guess the new generation era, if you will. For a long time, I regretted not being there. For a long time, I, I knew that was a tailor-made uh, situation for me. If they would have let me start to bring my own personality to my character, um, it would have been a totally different story. But that being said, I will say this. At the time that I actually left, I was getting pretty heavy into taking the painkillers and the drugs and all that stuff. And uh, shortly after I left, I got a phone call. I think Savio called me and said they sent out a memo telling everybody they weren't drug testing anymore. Uh, they stopped drug testing for a while. And, you know, where I am now, and uh, having finally gotten clean and sober and being in recovery and looking back on that, I came to the realization that if I really, if I was there during that era in the state that I was in right before I left, I probably would have been a statistic. I probably would have been one of the guys that uh, died during that seven years and 65 guys care of people just dying, you know, before they started drug testing again. Um, that's the reality. Um, you know, I was, I was really, I regretted it a lot for a long time and it ate me up for a long time, but I realize now that's the reality of it. Uh, if I was there, I may not be here anymore because I was one of the craziest, you know, I was wild. So that's kind of how it went down. So we went, we mentioned the word folklore a little bit ago and the folklore for years as a fan, you know, I just was starting to do interviews shortly after uh, the gimmick battle royal at WrestleMania 17. Um, the folklore was always that you were in rough shape. And I've heard you say that, too. But I remember watching it and thinking this guy is probably 10 years younger than the next closest guy in this in this match. And you looked good in the ring, I thought. Um Memories of your appearance at the Gimmick Battle Royal and uh, being called by the great Bobby Heenan and, and uh, Gene Okerlund, both of whom have left us and both of whom are a part of my intro because I was lucky enough to interview them while they were still here. Yeah, let me just say first and foremost, Bobby and Gene, two of the biggest class acts I've ever met, the greatest individuals I've ever met in the wrestling business and in life. And um, 
I've got to sit with Gene a couple times here more recently before he passed at conventions and stuff, and it was just always a blast. It was always an awesome experience. They were both really great and really nice and gracious to me. Um, as far as me, you know, I was in rough shape. Um, at the point the battle Royal, the gimmick battle Royal came up in that WrestleMania that yeah, year, I was still living down in Miami, Florida in real bad shape to the point where I had pretty much run out of money and I was on a, I was on drugs so bad that I ended up having to go to the methadone clinic where people would stand outside in a line in the morning to get their little methadone shot. So they didn't get dope sick because they were so addicted to opiate drugs. Um, so when I went to WrestleMania, I had to get three days worth to take with me in order to make it through the weekend, or I would have gotten really sick. If you look at me, I was really white and really skinny <laughs> compared to when I wrestled. And of course I had a shaved head, but as far as in the ring, we really didn't have to do much. We just walked around and punched each other and laughed and, you know, everybody goofing off and eventually doink clotheslined me out of the ring on the wrong side and double twisted my shoulders. But, um, as far as, yeah, I was really personally in bad shape and, um, I just, you know, I was glad to get up there and get in it and get the payday actually at that point. Cause that's how bad a shape I was in. So yeah, it was rough. All right. So I'm sure this is a big subject of your podcast and I don't want to take away from that, but let's talk just a little bit about life after wrestling. And you said you kind of became a recluse. You kind of went into a hole for a little while. Um, I guess let's, let's take a positive approach to it. What made you decide to crawl out of the hole and, and, say to everybody on the internet where where you know everybody's a celebrity online but uh when you go on there and say hey look i'm still around and everybody's fine again and everybody's so happy to see you and hear from you again what made you decide to do that and, and come out of hiding well you know it's an interesting story in 2000 and uh, you know i i got in a lot of trouble in 2013 i got busted um because i was out running the streets i live in tennessee now and i relapsed in 09 anyway I was running with the wrong people and got set up by one of those former friends and got busted. And I had a teaching career and everything. I lost everything. And I was heavy on drugs again, and it all fell apart. And I just wanted to disappear from the earth, <laughs> from everybody. I didn't want anybody to remember I existed, honestly. And, uh, you know, fast forward, I got clean and sober. I went through a drug court program. I changed you know, this, that was the second time I got clean. And that time I realized I had to do it differently. I had to humble myself and, and I had to talk about the things I went through and, um, I had to be more willing to share and help other people because that in turn would help me. Well, in the process, I met, uh, a wrestling promoter in middle Tennessee, a guy named Scott Hensley, who, I mean, literally he kept asking me to do an appearance at one of his shows for like two years. And I just kept saying, no, thanks, no, thanks. Cause I, was, I didn't want to show my face. You know, I was so embarrassed. Finally in 2018, I agreed. And the thing was, it wasn't even a great appearance for me because a lot of the people hadn't really seen me in so long. A lot of those folks didn't even know who I was. I looked so different, but I signed some autographs and met some people. But after that on social media, people started friend requesting me and instead of hiding like I had been doing for the years before that, I kind of opened up and started accepting friend requests and talking and interacting with the fans. And in doing so, they started to ask me questions about that era and different things. And they would send me pictures and videos of places I had been and where I was in the ring wrestling. And they would spur stories, uh, me to remember stories and I started telling stories on Facebook. And that's when people really kind of grabbed a hold of what I was doing. They got really excited. And I went from like 275 friends to like, I maxed out on Facebook at 5,000 friends within a few months because everybody was just word of mouth. People started telling, you know, people, guys were talking about it in the, in the indie locker rooms and wrestling fans were talking about it. And now everybody had podcasts different sorts of web pages and, and um more and more people were interested in talking to me and everybody was really nice you know and i started having fun 
interacting with the fans and I realized, you know, that's the way it should have been in my career yeah. when I was wrestling. It should have been fun. And now it's fun. <laughs> now I get to have fun and interact with the fans. It's not about trying to be rich and famous or anything anymore. It's just about having fun and talking about a time that people are looking back on, like I said, in a, in a nostalgic way. And part of my deal now is getting the word out and helping other people that are struggling with substance abuse and things like that. And I, it's created a platform for me to do that. And I appreciate that as well, but that's how all of this came about. And that's how things changed. Um, this one wrestling promoter got me to come out of my shell and then it just took off and I started doing conventions and everything. And, you know, interviews like this and my own podcast awesome. and all these things. And it's just been fun and I'm, I'm having fun with it and I have no expectations. It's just fun interacting with the fans. Cool. I know we're short on time, so I'll do two more questions and I'll let you get ready for your podcast. Like you said, oh. um, I wanted to share a memory since you mentioned sharing memories. I was at the Meadowlands Arena show where you got hurt. I was there in the crowd. I grew up in New Jersey. I was there. And I remember two things about that night. I remember that spot. For some reason, it just jumped out. Something wasn't right. And the other thing was Michael Hayes was singing Bad Street USA in front of the, in front of the arena before the show started <laughs> uh, to, uh, to like 25 people. But <laughs> Wow, that's crazy um, you were there, man. Yeah, that was a crazy – I mean, that – yeah, that was. I would say that was the beginning of the end because I started using a lot of drugs after that just to get by because I didn't want to come off the road because we were setting up for me to work Hunter in the pay-per-view. And, uh, yeah, I got hurt. It was pretty rough. I thought I was paralyzed for a couple seconds. Um, yeah, I went. He backdropped me out of the ring, and I missed the top rope, and I basically just flew from a full backdrop over the top rope and went free fall right to the concrete floor seated on my ass hit as hard as you could imagine hitting and felt like it crushed my spine. Um, but yeah, that was the spot. That's crazy. You were there. Um, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Meadowlands arena. <laughs> that's right. Not there. It, well, it's still there. I think it's physically still there, but they have not used it in two or three years. Now they closed Izod center. It was what they eventually called it. And now it's no longer in service. Yeah, I was just up there not too long ago doing a, a, a virtual signing and an appearance, and uh, we drove right by it because I was flying out of Newark. Yeah, old memories, man, seeing those places and craziness. But, yeah, that was part there of the go. story. That was just part of the deal, I guess. All right, final question for you. It's kind of a layup, kind of an easy one for you, uh, and that is where can people find your podcast? <laughs> My podcast streams live and for free on Facebook <clears throat> on, it was basically my private Facebook page, Mike Drosy. Um, that's where all of this started. Um, it's also on my Duke the Dumpster Road to Recovery page. It's also on Avi Klein's Facebook page. Uh, because he is, like I said, the mastermind of all this. And we all kind of broadcast each other's so it's on Don Morocco's page. It's on Paul Roma's page. It's on Bill DeMott's page. It's on Ray Lloyd's page. It's on Del Wilkes page. Because all of these guys are the other members of that podcast family um, and have their own podcast. So any of those Facebook pages, I mean, you it's all over Facebook now. So you can't miss it, uh, as well as those guys' podcasts. So I would encourage anybody uh, to definitely come and watch it. Mine is Fridays. It, 6 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Central Time, and it's called Road to Recovery, Duke the Dumpster, and uh, it's a great show. All right, man. Well, I wish you the best of luck with it. It's a lot of fun to listen to. Um, I'm going to share this thought with you, then I have one last favor. My cousin uh, did me a lot of favors. I lost him in 92, and a couple months before he passed away, he said to me, don't ever try drugs. If you do, you'll like them, and they'll kill you. And he was absolutely right. Absolutely yeah. right. That's so true. Yep. It's a All scary right. Thing. Final quick. Final uh, favor, if I can ask it for you. Do you mind if I ask for a station ID? Just saying, yep. this is Duke the Dumpster Drozzy, and you're listening to the Wrestling Epicenter. You got it. This is former World Wrestling Federation superstar Duke the Dumpster Drozzy, and you are listening to the Wrestling Epicenter. 
Hey guys, my name is James Walsh, and you are listening to the Wrestling Epicenter here on YouTube. I want to thank you for finding us. Please do me a favor and click that subscribe button and the notifications bell. If you get the chance on this video, click the like button. If you do, it'll turn blue. Check it out. Also, check out WrestlingEpicenter.com for all this great content available in MP3 format, our online store that'll keep us going free and clear, daily news updates, as well as all the information from the history of professional wrestling you could possibly ever want. Check out WrestlingEpicenter.com online right now. The preceding announcement was paid for by the Wrestling Epicenter. On the listen, and if you like what you heard, I'm glad. If you didn't like what you heard, go fuck yourself. <laughs> Most people don't hung up on me. <laughs> we had a lovely conversation. <laughs> <laughs> what a show. Oh, mercy, daddy. On the radio dial. Don't hang up. Bye-bye.